from D. James Kennedy Ministries. This is Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Hello, I'm Frank Wright, president of D. James Kennedy Ministries. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. This week is President's Day, and we have an outstanding resource I want to draw your attention to. It's a four-DVD series called The Bible and the Presidents, The Faith of Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln. It's available at our online store, along with a literal feast of other digital audio, video, and print resources. Just visit our ministry website at djkm.org. I once saw a woman wearing a beautiful gold cross, and I said to her, that is really lovely. Do you wear it primarily as jewelry, or does it have some deeper significance for you? She responded by saying, it really means a lot to me. And then I said, it really does represent something beautiful, doesn't it? The Son of God crucified for us. To be honest, at that point, she seemed to be a bit uncomfortable, but she did say, yes, it's important to have faith. You know, it is important to have faith, isn't it? But faith is one of those words that needs an object. We must have faith in something. To have some undefined sense of belief in a higher power is not really true faith. This is well illustrated by the difference between Christianity and deism. Christians put their faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Deists, on the other hand, see clear evidence of design and creation and assume there must be a creator. But they envision a creator who set his creation in motion at the beginning of time and has nothing to do with it now. That worldview offers you nothing to trust in. This deistic view has been attributed to some of America's founders, including George Washington. Well, which is it? Was Washington a Christian or a deist? Here is Dr. D. James Kennedy with his message, George Washington, Christian or deist? Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the first epistle of John, 1 John chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. May we hear the inspired word of the living God. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And may God speak to us today through his holy word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. George Washington was born on February 11th. Oh, you say, just wait a minute there, Pastor. I, um, You've got that wrong, and that's not too encouraging to us because you hardly got started yet. He was born on February 22nd, right? Wrong. 
He was born on February 11, 1732. But due to a change in the calendar and the method of computation, we now celebrate his birthday on the 22nd. He was born, as you no doubt know, in a very godly Episcopal family in Virginia, and he was taught the scriptures and taught how to live a godly Christian life from a very young age. Now, what they have done with him when they remember him at all is to turn him into something that he was not. They turn him into a deist. In fact, I read 10 American history texts that are taught in our public schools. And this is what your children are learning in public school. George Washington and almost everybody else that had anything to do with the founding of this country were not Christians, they were deists. By the way, how many of you have heard that? May I see your hands? Good many of you. Well, it wasn't probably as popular when you were in school, but that's the modern take on that matter. He was a deist. Now, what is a deist? There are two fundamental aspects to deism as it was brought about around the 1700s. First of all, it is the concept of an absentee landlord, of the clockmaker God, who created the clock, wound it up, put its laws into operation, and then went off on a long, long trek and hasn't been heard from since. The clockmaker God. The second thing about deism that they believed is that there is no revelation. We may know that such a God exists only by reason and not revelation. Therefore, there is no word of God written and there is no word of God living, Jesus Christ. God never sent a son because he never had one. And therefore, there is no atonement for sin. There is no resurrection. There is no promise of eternal life. And there is no providence. God is not watching over this world and caring for the inhabitants of it. He made it, he wound it up, and he went off to leave it on its own. Now that is a deist, for anyone that knows anything about deism. And let's compare that and see if indeed George Washington was a deist. Did he believe in providence? Did he believe in revelation? Did he believe in the atonement? Well, let's look at his own life and his own words. His mother taught him the Bible from his childhood, and also godly books, such as Contemplations Moral and Divine by Sir Matthew Hale, a marvelous book which contains wonderful uh, stories and illustrations of Christian virtues. Washington kept that book with him all of his life. And if you look at his life at the end of it, you'll see it is an unfolding of the virtues taught in that book. Add to your faith virtue. And that's what Washington spent his life doing so that he could be called the most virtuous man whose character, his morality, is the wonder of the world. And that was said by the Duke of York, his enemy during the Revolutionary War. Did he believe in providence? He said the American people, above all people that have ever lived, should be grateful to God for his divine providence. It was something that he talked about repeatedly, both in his official proclamations and in his personal conversation. And indeed, he had every reason to believe, as he did strongly, in the divine providence. One day, when he had been fighting in the French and Indian War, he was the a uh, colonel in charge of the forces of Virginia on the Western Front fighting the Indians. And the rumor came back to his brother 
that he had been killed and he had delivered before he died his dying speech. Well, when Washington heard of this, he sent off a very swift message to his brother saying, I must take this very opportunity to contradict the first that he had died and assuring you that I have not yet composed the second, his dying speech, but by an all-powerful providence. I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation. I had four bullets through my coat, two times my hat was shot off my head, and two horses were shot out from under me. But Washington was not scratched. And if that isn't remarkable enough, an instance of pro providence, about 15 years later with an aide, after, long after the war, he returned to that spot where the massacre had taken place of the Americans. And the Indian chief who had led the attack on the American forces traveled a long distance when he heard that that young warrior was returning. And he told Washington, I called to my young men and said, Mark yon tall and daring warrior. Let your aim be certain, and he dies. Our rifles were leveled, rifles which but for you, said this chief to Washington, but for you knew not how to miss. Twas all in vain. A power mightier far than we shielded you. I said, he can never die in battle. Throughout all of his military career, Washington was never once wounded in battle. The wise chief had instructed all of his marksmen to kill that man, the captain, the colonel on the white horse. They could not do it, an all-powerful providence. And the chief said, I said to my men that this man is protected by the great spirit and he will become the ruler of a great people and nation. An amazing prophecy by that Indian chief. Some have said he was austere and there's no doubt about the fact that he did not encourage too familiar relationships with many people. But he was not austere. He was compassionate and loving. To wit, his stepdaughter was dying. Washington heard of that and he immediately left his official duties and rode hard to get to his home. When he saw how frail she was and how worn out his wife was with caring for her, he looked on the feeble child and fell on his knees beside her bed and with a passionate burst of tears, he prayed to Almighty God. One writer said that upon the wings of that holy prayer, her spirit ascended to heaven. When he rose and looked upon the pale and placid face, Washington said, this sweet innocent girl has entered into a more happy and peaceful abode than she had met with in the afflicted path she had hitherto trod. And he commended her to the mercy of God. Indeed, Washington was a man of great compassion and great love and a man of great prayer. When a French statesman visited the country and asked at the Continental Congress which was George Washington, he was told, quote, he is the man on his knees when the Congress goes to prayer. Indeed, he was a man of prayer. Did he believe the Bible? The deist says there is no revelation. There are no scriptures. Did he believe that there were scriptures? Well, every night, no matter what he was doing, at nine o'clock promptly, he excused himself, went into his study, 
and his nephew closed the door, and his nephew one time had to go in some emergency and interrupt him. And when he went into the room, he found there was George Washington kneeling before a chair on which was an open Bible with a lampstand beside it. And from 9 until 10 o'clock, punctually every night, he spent that time reading the Bible and praying. And then he arose at 4 a.m. and from 4 until 5 returned to the same room, the same spot, the same chair, the same Bible, and again for another hour he prayed. And as many in that time did, he prayed aloud. You may recall the, the man that heard Washington pray. He was a Quaker out in the woods at Valley Forge, and he listened to his prayer. And he rushed back to his own house and told his wife. They were both opposed to the American Revolution and said, our cause is lost. God cannot help but hear and answer such prayers as I have just heard. Yes, Washington was a man who believed in prayer, and he obviously believed the Bible. He wouldn't have spent an hour every day reading it if he did not believe it. And of course, he believed that the providential aid of God is that which brought America through every step of the revolution. And he said for an American to not believe in God's providence would make him worse than an infidel. No, Washington was no deist at all. And what about his belief in the Sabbath and church? Some have even said he didn't attend church. I would recommend they simply read his, read his diary. Sunday such and such a date, attended church in the a.m. and again in the p.m. Sunday so, such and such a time, attended church in the morning. By the way, Washington was a collector. What do you collect? He collected sermons. And when the weather was too inclement, he would read a sermon to his family. When his father died and Washington was aged 11, his father who had conducted the daily sacrifice of their worship each morning, his mother said to him, now George, it is up to you to lead in the daily sacrifice every morning. So starting at 11 years of age, he led his family in the daily worship time that they had together. I don't know if you know this, but Washington also was a preacher. When did he preach and where? When as a colonel, he was in charge of the forces of Virginia protecting the western front of Virginia from the attack of Indians. He wrote several times requesting urgently that a chaplain be appointed for the conduct of worship service on the Sabbath. There was none that they could find who was willing to come. And so, for two years, every Sunday, Washington conducted worship services for his army. He had had a lot of practice as a child doing that. When Braddock was killed in the war with the Indians and the French, they, the troops wanted to leave and flee. But he said, no, he must have a proper burial. And he said, bury him right here in the middle of the road. <gasps> the middle of the road? Yes, in the middle of the road. So they quickly dug a hole and buried General Braddock in the hole. And then Washington said there must be a proper ceremony. So he pulled out his prayer book, which he always carried with him, and conducted a funeral service right there in the middle of the road with an army of Indians coming down upon them. Why in the middle of the road? He knew if they found the site, they would dig up the body, steal his uniform and desecrate it. And so he ordered that all of the wagons and the cannons be rolled over the spot so it could not be seen when they left. Yes, he had a great respect for the Sabbath and he always went to church whenever that was possible. And sometimes, folks, that meant riding 40 miles 
on a horse in the snow to go to church. But he went whenever he could. And whenever he couldn't, he conducted church at home. He was indeed a most pious man. But he, did he really believe in Christ and his atonement? Some say that he, he didn't, that he wasn't really a Christian. He may have been religious, he may have been virtuous, but he wasn't really a Christian. Well, I would simply point that person to Washington's own most precious book that was sold in auction at the end of the 19th century. It is his own prayer diary where Washington wrote prayers and he kept these with him throughout his life. Listen to them. So, see if this sounds like a deist or a Christian. Pardon, I beseech thee my sins. Remove them from thy presence so far as the east is from the west and accept me for the merits of thy son, Jesus Christ. I have called on thee for pardon and forgiveness of sins, but so coldly and carelessly. Listen to this. I have asked thee for pardon and forgiveness of sins, but so coldly and carelessly that my prayers are become my sin. I prayed two hours a day. I wonder how many of you ask God to forgive you for your prayerlessness. I doubt that any of you ask God to forgive you for your prayers. And they stand, he said, in need of pardon. I have heard thy holy word, but with such as you have today, but with such deadness of spirit that I have been an unprofitable and forgetful hearer. Cover my sins with the absolute obedience of thy dear Son, that those sacrifices which I have offered may be acceptable by thee in and for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ offered upon the cross for me. Direct my thoughts, words, and works. Wash me from my sins in the immaculate blood of the Lamb. Purge my heart by thy Holy Spirit from the dross of my natural corruption. Thou gavest thy Son to die for me. A deist could not pray one single one of those prayers. No, my friends, George Washington was the very antithesis of deism. How grateful we should be that we have a Christian foundation for this country. And all of the efforts of all of the naysayers and infidels of our own time are that not able to destroy that foundation, no matter how hard they work at it. President Wilson said, unless we know from whence we have come, we shall not know who we are or what we ought to do. We come from such a foundation as this for which we ought to be eternally grateful. And we should strive to restore that foundation and build on it for a glorious future. When Washington came to the end of his life, which was very difficult, for a long time he had great difficulty breathing, and he said to his doctor, Doctor, I die hard. I might wish that it would be easier, but I know that it is for my own good. I am not afraid to die. The family was gathered around him. When it came to the very end, he took his own hands and crossed them over his breast, doing all things with perfect propriety. And he said, "'Tis well. Father, into thy mercy I commend my soul." And he died. Would that we all could die as well and live as well as George Washington, the Christian, the Christian father of this nation. May we pray. 
Father, may we follow in the footsteps of this great founder of this nation. God, we confess our sin, that we have not confessed our sins as we ought, but often coldly and indifferently. May we be convicted by the convicting life of George Washington ourselves, that we may live more like Christ and to serve him in every part of our being. For we ask this in his most holy name. Amen. Can you, like George Washington, say, it is well with my soul? Have you placed your trust for this life and the next in Jesus Christ and Him alone? If not, the Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation, and it can be the start of a brand new life following Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. If you'd like to know for certain that you'll be with God in heaven someday, we can go to God together in prayer right now saying, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to know you as my Savior and I ask you to forgive me for my sins. Today, I place my trust in you and receive the gift of eternal life that you paid for with your death on the cross. Please cleanse me and make me brand new so that I may live a life that honors you. In your name I pray, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. And we have a special gift to help you begin to grow in your new faith. It's Beginning Again, the book written by Dr. Kennedy for new believers. In these pages, you'll learn how to study the Bible, how to pray, and so much more. We don't want you to miss out on this special gift, so please request Beginning Again by writing to the address on your screen or calling our toll-free number. God bless you as you do. Dr. Kennedy was passionate about the Christian convictions of our founding fathers in an age when many skeptics have attempted to portray them as merely deists. It was one of the unique aspects of his singular ministry. We'll be happy to send you his message, George Washington, Christian or Deists, to you for your personal library or to share with others who need to hear the truth about our first president. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11164, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339. Or call toll free 888-332-3069. Or you can go online to djkm.org. And let us know if you would like a CD or DVD copy of this message. And please, Include a generous gift toward the ongoing work of this ministry. We are standing for truth and defending your freedom. Thanks for standing with us. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Kennedy Classics. We'll see you next time. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.